I've been working on a project that I've been dreaming about since the very beginning of my career as a maker. I want to build a desktop machine in the vein of a 3D printer or a laser cutter that can automatically fabricate circuit boards. In this video, I'll show you the progress that I've made over the last year or so, and I'll hint at where this project could go in the future. It takes about a week or two to get a prototype PCB, and it takes even longer when you're working in industry, but I've been spoiled by the speed of 3D printing, and I'd like to be able to get rough prototypes for circuit boards just as quickly. The only way to accomplish that is to make circuit boards in-house. There are a couple of existing methods, but none that can produce adequate multi-layer boards. Now let's talk about my intended scope for this project. The machine should be self-contained and fit on a desktop. A footprint comparable to a 3D printer would be great. It should be fully automatic after the initial setup, so the user should press start and then walk away. It should be able to make two layer boards. That means cutting traces and generating simple vias. Higher layer counts would be too much of a stretch for now, but I'd love to get there someday. But I will not be attempting solder mask or silkscreen. They aren't explicitly necessary for prototypes and traces and vias will already be challenging enough. Sounds simple, right? No, not at all. The hardest part by far is making the vias, and that also happens to be the most important part. For the uninitiated, vias are the connections between the layers of a circuit board. They're what allow you to go from one layer to two, and that is a really big deal. Single layer boards can only accommodate very simple circuits, but two layer boards can technically accommodate any circuit of any complexity. Since vias are so essential, they will be the first focus of this project, and they'll be the focus of this video. So how are we gonna make them? Circuit board manufacturers have a standard method they use for making their vias. Starting out with copper clad board, they drill small holes everywhere they want there to be a via. They then perform electroless copper deposition, which is a chemical process that deposits a thin layer of copper over all surfaces, including inside of the hole. Finally, standard electroplating is used to build up the copper that's already inside the hole. And what you're left with is a solid copper connection between two layers. This process is great for mass production, but it is terrible for a workshop environment. Environment. Electroless deposition requires over a dozen chemical steps, and it involves solutions that are corrosive and toxic and difficult to maintain. For this project, we need to reinvent this standard process, and for usability, we want to remove all chemical baths. I have about a dozen different ideas for alternative via generation methods, but the one that I chose to start with could hypothetically produce vias that are identical to production vias. The main problem with the standard method is the complexity of electroless deposition. The purpose of that step is to create an initial high resistance connection between the two layers. But we can accomplish the same goal by instead using something like a carbon-based conductive ink. Now, coating everything in ink and then electroplating would leave a nasty finish and would still require some chemical baths. But I think I have a solution. Here's my proposed process. First, a small hole will be drilled into the copper clad board. The machine would have two tool heads, one above and one below the board, and each with an open-ended tube. The tool heads would then compress onto the board with their openings aligned with the hole, creating a continuous path through all three components. With the tool head sealed against the copper layers, conductive ink can be pumped through the tubes, coating the inside of that hole. After some dry time, electroplating solution can be pumped through the hole, and with the help of an inline electrode, the final via can be plated. By creating vias one at a time, the board never needs to be moved or rinsed, making this process much more friendly to automation. So let's give it a shot. I first upgraded my setup and then got to work designing an initial proof of concept. The goal for the initial test was just to see if this constrained electroplating could work in any capacity. The design uses gravity to push electrolyte solution from the top reservoir through the board down into a bottom pan. After drilling a one millimeter hole in the board, I used a little paintbrush to coat the inside of that hole with conductive ink. I assembled the test setup, added my copper electroplating solution, and grounded the board. I then electroplated in 30 second intervals by inserting a copper electrode into the the electrolyte reservoir. And I was genuinely shocked by how well this test went. After only 90 seconds, the via resistance dropped to only 30 milliohms. For reference, production vias are usually 20 to 30 milliohms. So my initial test reached production levels of performance on the first try after only a minute and a half. This result was very encouraging, so I committed to designing a much more substantial prototype. This new design was still only concerned with via generation. The prototype included two custom tool heads, each with altered core XY actuation and a microfluidic pump system to control the two liquids. I think it looks pretty impressive, but in hindsight, 
This approach had a fatal flaw that I should have recognized before I designed anything. But before we discover that flaw, there is a lot of fun engineering to discuss. First, give me a second to thank this video's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is a full-featured circuit board prototyping service. It might seem ironic that this video will be sponsored by a circuit board manufacturer, but PCBWay can do so much more than the simple two-layer boards that I'm aspiring to. They manufacture precision circuit boards that can do everything your project will need, including up to 14-layer boards, flexible circuit boards, and assembly, starting at just $5 with 24-hour build time. PCBWay also does CNC machining and 3D printing, so whether you're an RF engineer or an aerospace space engineer, a roboticist, or just a hobbyist, PCBWay has what you need to bring your vision into reality. I'll be using their services in this project in the future, and one day I'll find an excuse to get one of their aluminum core PCBs, because that's just really awesome. Now, back to the engineering. I started with a tool head. After collecting my thoughts on a whiteboard, I realized that the Z-axis would need to use a spring to compress the end effector into the board. Without a spring, so if the end effector was driven directly, the drive motor would easily lose step and the force used to seal the interface would be unknown. By inserting a spring, the applied force can be easily controlled by the position of the Z-axis. This can prevent motor over-torquing and as an added benefit, this means that the Z-axis doesn't need to be precise so a simple rack and pinion mechanism can be used. With this and many smaller details in consideration, I designed the first iteration of the tool head using linear bushings to constrain the Z-axis. I fired up a 3D printer, assembled the prototype and connected it up to a motor driver to see if it moved like I had expected. And it mostly did, but there was an issue. The end effector was way too wobbly considering the precision movement I would need to do down the line. At this point, I had caught myself doing something that I've done many times before. I was making compromises to make the design smaller even though space was not constrained. I like my designs to be compact, so sue me. And sometimes, or most times, that comes at a cost. The end effector mechanism had play because of the linear bushings I used to minimize the size. What I should have used were linear guides, which would have been bigger, but also would have been pretty rock solid. So I jumped back into CAD and designed the second iteration of the tool head, this time suppressing my desire for compactness. After another round of 3D printing and assembly, I hooked the prototype back up to the motor driver for testing. This time though, everything looked great. The linear guide did its job and the end effector did not budge. On to the next design challenges. I needed a way to move the tool heads in the X and Y axes, and I wanted to use a core XY design. These systems are commonly used in 3D printers. They only need two motors and both motors are kept stationary, which is convenient for several reasons. But I've always had a little problem with core XY designs. They require two large and overlapping belt loops, and since those loops overlap, they have to be stacked vertically, which means that the design is asymmetric and takes up more space. And you already know that I like my designs to be compact even when it does not matter. So I tried to come up with an altered version that would use a single belt to engage with both motors. And I did. It looked like it would work perfectly. Core XY systems work because the belt loops change shape, but they never change their total length. The loops never get stretched. Segments of a loop will get longer, but other segments will always shorten by the same amount to compensate. The new arrangement I came up with works on the exact same principles. It's just smaller and it uses fewer parts. I threw the design into CAD with an extruded aluminum frame, and there are two gantries here, one for each tool head. Preparing the parts for this thing was a bit brutal. I didn't have any access to power tools or even to a vise, so cutting the 2020 extrusion was honestly miserable. But assembly is always a fun process, so it was worth it in the end. After hooking the system up to a couple of motor controllers, it moved just like a standard Core XY system as I was expecting. Moving one motor at a time resulted in diagonal movement, while moving the motors simultaneously resulted in movement along a single axis. At this point, I was really wondering why everyone doesn't use this altered design, which is clearly better in every way. And then I realized a problem. The gantry bar could twist a little bit, especially when moving along the x-axis. It didn't look that substantial visually, but I knew it would prevent any precision movement. At first I thought the belts weren't tight enough, but further tensioning didn't help. After doing a little bit of research, I realized that the mechanism was the problem. It turns out that common designs are common for a reason. Who would have guessed? The belts in a Core XY system apply various torques to the gantry while accelerating the tool head. In a standard Core XY, these torques 
cancel each other out, so the gantry is never made to twist. But in this single belt loop core XY, the torques do not cancel, hence my lack of precision. A really robust frame could still make this work, but that's not what I had built. This still wasn't the fatal issue though. I really only cared about the application of the ink and the electroplating, so this is something that I could fix in the future, but that didn't really matter for now. So now I had a tool head and a way to move it, I just needed a way to control the two liquids, and that meant some microfluidics. In total, I needed a pump, a reservoir, and a way to connect everything together. Originally, I used PTFE tubing to make the connections, but I didn't have a way to make connectors that were both small and reliably watertight. I switched to silicone tubing because its flexibility allowed me to use barb connectors. I could 3D print simple barbs, and they would be consistently watertight. For the pump, I designed a stepper motor driven peristaltic pump. They're pretty easy to make and the liquids aren't exposed to any moving parts, which is great for my use case where the liquids are both sticky and corrosive. Peristaltic pumps are very simple. They contain a silicone tube that gets pinched at multiple points between the pump body and bearings that are connected to the motor shaft. As the motor rotates, these pinch points move along the silicone tube pushing on the liquid. Lastly, the reservoir was pretty simple. It's designed with an inlet on the top and the bottom Bottom, and it's intended to never be full, so there should always be some amount of air at the top of the reservoir. This way, if the pump turns in one direction, the line will be filled with liquid. If the pump turns the opposite way, the line will be filled with air, emptying the system. This is an important feature because the proposed via generation method requires that the line is repeatedly broken and then reformed. I could also mention that the pumps are connected to the bottom sides of the reservoirs and that they double as electronically controlled valves. With the addition of this micro microfluidic system, I had a completed first prototype and I was ready to begin testing. Except that testing went nowhere. Remember that fatal flaw I mentioned? Well, it was ready to teach me a lesson. Its lesson was not to jump the gun. The flaw in my approach was that I was adding confounding variables before I knew if my foundation was solid. I tried to test, but nothing was working and I eventually realized that the alignment of the two tool heads was almost always totally off, and I had no way to check it. I couldn't produce useful data because I didn't know if my basic assumptions were being met. In hindsight, I was nowhere near ready to add X and Y axis movement, all it did was compromise the purpose of the prototype. I was more concerned with how cool it would look than what it would actually teach me. So I went back to the drawing board. The microfluidics and the tool head designs were still promising, so I wanted to preserve them, but I completely removed all lateral movement. The second prototype was much simpler than the first. The two tool heads were mostly the same as before, but I combined the two back plates into a single monolithic component. Combining the two parts meant that the alignment of the tool heads was guaranteed by the design. This is what I should have done from the very beginning. After one more round of assembly, I was finally ready to start testing and see if this via generation method would work. I wanted to start by replicating the success I had had with my initial proof of concept. So I drilled a one millimeter hole into a fresh copper clad board and I inserted it into my assembly. It still took a little effort to get the two end effectors in the hole all aligned, but it was manageable. My plan was to just turn the pumps by hand so that I could maintain full control. I extended the tool heads and slowly turned the conductive ink pump to fill the line. Once I saw it pass the board, I turned the pump in the opposite direction to empty the system. I opened up the mechanism and what I saw was very promising. The ink had coated the inside of the hole and I had successfully created a high resistance connection between layers. The conductive ink step worked. I gave the ink about 20 minutes to dry and then I realigned the hole with the electroplating side. I extended the tool heads again, grounded the board, and then turned the other pump to fill the line with electroplating solution. I electroplated in 30 second intervals measuring the resistance after each time. And it was bad. The resistance was dropping way too slowly and it plateaued far above the 30 milliohms I was targeting. I ran several more attempts changing which electrodes were used, the direction of the electrolyte flow, the speed of the electrolyte flow, but nothing worked. Somehow, I couldn't replicate the success of that simple proof of concept. Eventually, I realized that the problem was not mechanical or chemical, it was electrical. 
the electrolyte solution was much more resistive than I had expected, and it was limiting my plating current to just hundreds of microamps. I needed to generate a higher voltage so that I could push more current through it. So I used some random components I had laying around to make a high voltage boost converter, and it got me from 12 volts up to 80 volts. I ran another test with higher plating current, and it went much better. I was able, finally, to achieve results similar to my proof of concept. But that wasn't the end of the story. This was a one millimeter diameter hole that would be fitting for a through hole component, but most vias are only 0.3 millimeters in diameter. I needed this to work with smaller diameters or it was not a success. I tried. I tried and I tried again, but I could not produce a 0.3 millimeter via. I found myself with conflicting parameters. I could allow for a maximum of three minutes of electroplating per via. Beyond that, doing an entire PCB would just take an unreasonably long time. Electroplating that quickly requires high current, but when I increase the current, the copper would creep up into the end effector, not deposit inside of the hole where I needed it. I could find no solution that satisfied my success criteria. This method could work if I could give it 10 or 15 minutes of plating time per via, but that's just not practical. The fundamental issue here is that you can't rush chemistry. In production, every via on a panel is plated simultaneously, so this issue is unique to my approach. I realized that there was no path forward, and I threw in the towel. So now what? Well, I'm not done with this. I think I've done a pretty good job demonstrating that this method won't work, but I've come up with about a dozen alternative methods, and a few of them could actually be viable. I've already done some experimentation with an alternative method that I wasn't super happy with, but the next via generation method I'm gonna be trying is very interesting. If I could get it to work, which is a very big unknown, it could hypothetically produce vias that are better than production vias by one to two orders of magnitude. There will be updates on this project in the future, but I don't know when that'll be. It could be a very long time. If you're interested in where this project goes or whatever else I get up to, then consider subscribing. I'll also put some of my CAD files on Patreon if you want to explore my designs in depth. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned something, and thanks for watching. Bye bye.